Um, I've just got a little talk I want to do about, um, about images, talking about raster images and vector images and all that sort of carry on. And then we're going to jump back into ARCHICAD again and um, continue with, with ARCHICAD. All right. So, I'm going to start right from the beginning and talk about bits and bytes and kilobytes and channels and all sorts of things. So this is all kind of just fundamentals that you should know and it will also um, give you the power to understand why your print job took you know, an hour and a half to come out. So, let's start off with a bit. So, a computer uses a binary system of ones and zeros. We usually talk about them ones and zeros, uh, plus five volts or zero volts or whatever it might be. Okay, on and off. Have you want to think about it? Um, and these are re represented by the lowercase b. So whenever you see kilobits or kilobytes or megabits, bits is, um, means that it's it, you know, so many ons and offs or ones and zeros. The amount of information that a raster image contains is often indicated by the number of bits per pixel. So you quite often see this like on scanners, it will say 24 bits per pixel. Um, that means that it can store 24 ones and zeros for every pixel that it scans. Okay, or it might be 36 bit or 12 bit or 8 bit. You know, it's a, it's, um, you know, a bit of a resurgence of 80s graphics and it's referred to as 8 bit graphics. Okay, so there's eight ones and zeros that represent uh, that can represent data for any one pixel. The size of an image is directly proportional to the number of pixels in the image and how many different values each pixel can have. So, what the hell do I mean about that? All right. So, if we had a one-bit um, image, and you can get these. In fact, if you get like an AO scanned. Um, quite often they will give you a one-bit image. That means that it will actually be really, really high resolution, which is fantastic. It means you can zoom right in onto exactly where you know, two lines are crossing each other and when you're tracing it in CAD, you're, you're bang on. You don't need lots of shades of grey or pink and blue and all the rest of it. All you need is really high resolution. Okay, so a one-bit image, which I'm going to show you in a second, um, isn't like, oh, who the hell would ever use that? It's actually a very powerful thing because if you're only storing one bit for every pixel, you can have a whole lot more pixels. Okay. Um, so then we work our way through. Two bits is four values. Okay, so that's zero, zero, or zero, one, one, zero, one, one. Okay, so that's two bits. That means that we've only got two sets of ones and zeros, but we can have four different values. Every time we add a bit, we double the value. So we have three bit. We've got eight values. Okay, four bit. Okay, so eight bit. Here we've got here eight bit graphics. There's 256 different values. Okay, so you'd have in the 80s, you'd had, you know, at, at the peak of the 80s at least, you had 256 different colours. 24 bit gives you 16.8 million values. Okay, so you can imagine if you've got a 32 bit image, it's even more than that. I have no idea what that is, but it's a massive number. All right, so here's our one-bit image. Okay, so it's a very, this, okay, this isn't a very high-res scan, but as we zoom in, you can see that the pixels are either on or off. Okay? Big and chunky. Okay, so we've got bits. Everybody understand that? Is that new to anybody? Yep. It is. Okay, that's cool. All right. So a byte is... 8 bits. So when we talk about bytes, we're talking about sort of a bunch of bits. 8 of them, in fact. So that means that if you've got one byte, you've got 256 different values that that can represent. Okay? Um, and it's represented by the capital B. So there's a big difference between a capital B and a little b. So if you're writing kilobits, if you put a capital K, capital B, you're meaning kilobytes. And it's a totally different number. Okay, it's eight times larger. Um, examples where, so now this is very common where, where we group things into bytes, okay, into eight bits. And so this is where we get our eight bit graphics from. Um, grayscale images are quite typically, they'll be, um, have one byte, okay, or eight ones and zeros representing all the different shades of grey. So 256 shades of grey. Um, for most parts, that's fine. You will find, though, if you're trying to do like a height map, 
um, which is like a grayscale representation of landform. Well, that only gives you 256 different heights, which in some cases would be more than enough. In other cases, if it was like you know the Swiss Alps, it's not going to be enough values, and you're going to you, you have to go to 16-bit grayscale images. Okay, so um, some web graphics, um, GIF. We're going to talk about different file formats. GIF has 256 different colors. They can be any color, but there can only be a maximum of 256 of them. So it kind of what it does is it creates like a table of of um, of colors. So which is fine if it's like a logo. You know, if it's a tip top logo, there's you know half dozen colors. 256 different shades of that of those colors will give it nice gradation between the one color and the next and all that sort of stuff. Works brilliantly. Okay, if it was a photo of your mum at a barbecue, 256 colors isn't probably going to cut it, and you're going to it's going to look horrible. We're going to talk a little bit about file formats shortly. Um, text or at least ASCII text um, used to have 256 values. They've got now a new one which has like 16 million different characters that you can have, which is probably why, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but some fonts will have every character you could possibly imagine, including Chinese ones and Hebrew and all sorts of things. Um, traditional ASCII text is 256 different characters. So you remember your uppercase, lowercase, symbols, numbers, all that sort of carry on. All right, so that's the byte. So, now, we move on to channels. Now, you've probably seen this in Photoshop, and there's a little tab next to the layers, and it's got another tab that says channels. What a channel is, is you can kind of think of it as, um, as plates in a printing process. So, when you go and print you know, a nice glossy magazine, it has four plates, C and Y, K, sometimes more. It might have a glossy plate as well that prints gloss onto the page. But each one of those plates picks up one colour and prints it onto the page. Okay, so it'll be cyan, you know, magenta, and it prints four plates on top of each other. And when you, if you look really closely, you can see like little dots, those moray patterning sort of dots that um, that will give you the illusion of colour. Okay, so you'll see some amazing shade of purple. Doesn't actually exist. It's actually a combination of red and blue, and you know, maybe a little bit of whatever else. So, um, even our RGB images are made up with channels. So normally each channel has 8 bits per channel. So that means that the, uh, if we're looking at an RGB image, we've got three channels, red, green and blue. That's what you're looking at on your screen. Okay, red, green and blue. Each one of those pixels can have 256 different levels of, of red, green or blue. Make sense? Okay, um, you'll notice that, yes, yeah, some will have up to 16 bits. So you'll notice in Photoshop you can change your mode to 16 bits per pixel. So you'd have a much wider range. In film and TV, they'll quite often use 10 bits per pixel or 12 bits per pixel, which just gives them more colours. Remember, if you just go from 8 bit to 9 bit, you double the number of values. 9 bit has 512 different um, values. Okay, so you go 10 bit, you've got 1,024 different shades of red. So it means that if the people are doing like green screen footage, they've got a lot more resolution, a lot more detail to work with that they can just determine what's green and what's, you know, the actor's blonde hair, something like that. So typically though we would see 8 bits per channel. Um, a grayscale image with one channel has 8 bits, which is 256 shades of grey, we already talked about that. Colour image has three channels, red, green and blue. And I'm going to show you a little example of this. So here's um, a picture of the Sky Tower, taken quite some time ago. And we're going to break it down now into its red, green and blue channels. Oops. Sorry. So that's the red, the green and the blue. So you can see in the blue channel, the Sky Tower is really bright. Okay, because what we're saying is there's a lot of blue in this image. Okay, there is, in fact, a little bit of red and a little bit of green as well. If I mix red, green and blue all together, I get white. So if I had just blue, which is probably the very top of the tower, you can see it's really kind of just blue. It's almost white over here, and the other channels it's pretty much black. Okay, you can see the red streaks, barely visible over here. Some of them are completely gone. 
and the red channel very, very, very bright. Cool? So that's um, an RGB image broken down into its separate channels. So, um, so when you add that all up, it means it's a 24-bit image. Each pixel has three bytes representing its red, green, and blue. I've just talked about that. Um, okay, so we've got three bytes because there's eight. One byte for the red, one byte for the green, one byte for the blue. Okay, so that's. But when you combine that all together, it gives you 16 million different colours that you can produce from that. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing. If you look at it, remember, um, 24 bits gives you 16 million different colours. So it's a combination of red, green, and blue. You can jiggle those around as much as you like, you'll get 16 million different colours. Most graphic programs will allow you to choose colours by their RGB values. So, for example, black is 000. This is quite handy, because if you're in Photoshop and you come up with a particular shade of red and you like it, it might be, you know, 2... 200, 55, 55, or something like that. Um, you can write that down, and if you're in ARCHICAD, you can create a pen and make the same red. If you're in another graphics program, you can make the same red. And in theory, they should all look the same. It's a lot more complicated than that, but in theory, they should all look the same. Um, pure red would be, so that's RGB, 25500. White is 255, 255, 255. If all those values are always the same, if it was 100, 100, 100, it would be a grey, a shade of grey. Make sense? You could have blue greys and red greys and orangey greys or something, I suppose. All right. So, does everybody understand RGB images? Cool. So, now you know why if you've got a 16 bit image and it's you know, 3,000 DPI, it's going to be really, really big. If it's a one-bit image, it was 3,000 DPI. It actually wouldn't be so big at all. CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Okay, it's K because B is blue. So that's why they use K for black. Make sense? I suppose so. Um, it's used for printing materials. Now, you've got to remember that printed images are different to images you see on the screen, on the screen you're emitting light. Okay, so it's a combination of red, green and blue will make white, for example. If you take cyan, magenta, yellow and black and you mix it together, you don't get white. It's a reflective process, it's absorbing colour. So if you put all that ink on the page, it's going to absorb all the colour and it's going to be black. So it's quite a different process and that means also that it has quite a different, what's called a gamut. A gamut is the the, the range of colours something is something can do. So your RGB screen is actually has a wider gamut than the printing process does. And one area you'll notice this is greens. If you choose a brilliant bright green on your screen, thinking this is awesome, I'm a landscape architect and I love big bright brilliant green, you go to print it, it will probably come out quite dull. And so um, we're going to see this in Photoshop, for example. They'll actually warn you if you try and choose a really bright green, you'll see a little, um, a little icon underneath it with a warning symbol and another shade of green. That basically means that if you choose that green, this is what you'll probably get when you print. Um, we have 32-bit images, including transparency or an alpha channel. So this is um, when you have images that for example, in Photoshop, if you go and erase something, you have transparency. So you've got red, green, blue, and a transparent value. And so, you know, you can like partially erase something. What you're doing is you've got this other 8-bit channel that is saying this is 50% transparent. So you can see through it. So in actual fact, most of your Photoshop images have actually got this extra channel on it. So you actually have a 32-bit image. So you've got your one, one byte for red, one byte for green, one byte for blue, another byte for transparency. That transparency channel, it's a little bit vague in Photoshop. You don't really see it. Um, normally, though, in the, in the industry, it's called an alpha channel. Alpha channel just basically means an extra channel. Normally, that would be transparency. In Photoshop, it's a little bit different. It actually has a transparent value. But you can have alpha channels in Photoshop, and they're usually used to save things like a selection, so if you're in Photoshop and you go and create a selection, it takes you 
ages and you can go up to save selection, it'll create a new channel for you and it'll be a black and white image showing what was selected and what wasn't. And if you command click on that, it'll recreate the selection. Um, I'm not doing a Photoshop lesson right now, but just take my word for it. <laughs> okay, so extra channels, of course, are going to make your, your file size larger. When you do film CAD, these extra channels are really important to you because we can render out of a um, program like View, we can render out extra channels. Some of these channels could say, um, have a different colour for every object in the scene. So that when you're in Photoshop, you can just go, right, magic wand to the tree, and it will select the entire tree perfectly from the background. Um, you might have another channel for um, what's up, down, left, and right. So if you choose all the shades of blue, it would be all the left-hand sides of objects in the scene. There's so many complex ones. There's even ones that will give you a different value for how long it took to render every single pixel on the screen. So you can find out, okay, that little rowboat in the bottom corner took twice as long to render than anything else on the screen, I might just get rid of it. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of these channels. Um, and we'll look at those, prob well, those sort of things we'd look in the next paper. Um, indexed colour images, this is what I was talking about with GIF. So it's actually a table of colours, it just makes up a whole bunch of colours and then it goes, right, colour number one is this particular shade of purple, colour number two is this shade of orange, this colour number three, so on and so on. Okay, so it's got um, lots of different colours, but it's only got 256 of them that it will display or store. So for limited colour things, it's fine. Okay, a cyan picture of your mum at a barbecue, fine, it would represent that, no worries. Fully colourful reds and greens and blues and oranges, it's going to run out of different colours and it's going to look ugly. The reason it does it though is because if it's only got 256 colours it's using, it can make a really small file size. Okay. Um, duotone just basically means it's got two channels. So this is when you get like newsprint and sometimes it'll be black and there'll be red. You know, or like in the yellow pages, like quite often they'll have duotone stuff where it's just got like an extra colour. Um, vector images use vectors instead of pixels, which we kind of talked about last week. Um, so we'll move on to vector images. Is there any questions now about raster images? You're going to start seeing this. And um, so, yeah, the main things to remember um, uh, bits, bytes, understand that. Okay, channels. And you're going to see these things, especially in Photoshop, you're going to see it a lot. You'll see that you've got an 8 bit image. You know, if you import a raw file that you've taken on your flash camera and you import it into Photoshop, it's going to ask you, do you want this to be an 8 bit TIFF or a 16 bit TIFF? Okay, and it's like, ooh, okay. Remember, if you get a 16 bit TIFF, yes, you're going to get a whole lot more colours. But if you're not going to edit the colours in there, there's not much point. Um, if you're just going to go, right, I just need to print this, you know, it's the, the, the difference in colours uh, would be imperceivable. However, if you were taking a photo and you knew that the colours were really wrong, you know, you might have, might have been a little bit overexposed and, or a little bit blue because you had the white balance set wrong, you need that really fine detail so that you can pull all the colours back out from all being in a blue range to being pulling them to being you know, reds and greens again. And you'd need that little separation between the colours is going to actually be very, very vital for you. However, it's going to make your file size immense. So if you're doing then Photoshop work on top of that, every time you add another layer, you're adding another photo. And if it's a 16 bit, so that's 16 bits per channel. Um, and then you've got some extra channels that you've created and some transparency. Every time you create a new layer, your document is going to get massive and more and more massive, especially if it's like a 21 megapixel image. Yeah. You can see that the numbers, if you tried to calculate them just for one pixel, are going to be massive. So... Warning. All right, vector images. Vector images are quite different. You can't take a photo into in vectors. Vectors basically um, is what I talked about last week: the point, line, and polygon. So kind of going over it again. Okay, so it's a point in space, or two points in space if it was a vector, and a line, an imaginary line, really connecting the two. Computers love this because that's how they work. 
Okay, they, it's all calculated images. So it means if it doesn't matter how much you zoom up on that line, you're never going to see a pixel. Okay, it's a calculated line. So it zooms in, it knows, well, if there's a point here and a point here, the line's going to go straight through my screen over here. You zoom in further and further and further, you're just going to see a line on the screen. Okay? So examples of this would be um, CAD, obviously. Um, animation like um, South Park type animation, um, that sort of stuff is usually vector images. Okay? It's like solid colours with edges. Uh, web graphics are like flash animations and print. So um, text and lines and shapes and print are vector. Okay? If every page in a magazine was a raster image, it would end up being a very, very large document and very difficult to work with. So you'll find that um, most of the stuff that you're doing, like InDesign, is all vectors. Okay? Plus it's got raster information in it as well. Here's an image. But most of the content on the screen are vector-based. All the, the lines and fonts, um, all of that sort of stuff is all just vectors. The raster is a bunch of little pixels, a lot of little dots. Yeah, it would be a picture. But yeah, but you could store a line drawing as a raster document. So if I got a bit of paper and drew a line across it and then scanned it, that's a raster document. If I zoom in though, I eventually will see pixels. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a very efficient way of storing it. It means I've got to store all this information for all the white space on my page, plus the information of the black line or whatever colour it might be. Not really, because it's a whole bunch of little squares. So it depends at what, you know, if you go in really close and you turn that into a vector image, you'd end up with a vector image that went like this. You know, so the computer doesn't, it might be quite smart, and you'll see like an illustrator, it has a vectorize option, and with the right settings, it should turn that back into a line, but it might not be a dead straight line. It might be a bit curvy or a bit wobbly or not, you know, overshoot, that sort of thing. Yeah, so... Um, uh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, where was I up to? So, yeah, so lines, print, that's right. So when we're doing things like a page layout, and we're going we're gonna to see this um, later on in the semester, when we're going to do a page layout, if you're doing an AO, if that's a raster document, it's going to have to be a massive raster document. So this is why you can't really do 300 DPI A1s because the file size just gets too big. And we see this all the time where people try and do a 300 DPI, 5 metre long banner, you know, by AO sort of height, and it just doesn't come out of the printer. The printer can't deal with it because it's all lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pixels. If the same thing was like um, a vector file, it's not a problem. It goes to the printer and it gets all the way to the printer and the printer will interpolate all of those vectors and turn them into printer dots at the printer. So it's a much, much, much smaller file. And you would have noticed this, like, for example, a PDF document um, can be quite small. PDF documents store things as vectors. It also can store rasters in there, but in a quite a different manner. So if you're doing a page layout in, in Illustrator or InDesign or Acrobat, it's got a whole bunch of text, all of that's all vectors, and it goes, and there's a little picture in here. Okay? If you did the same thing in Photoshop, it would be pixel, 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 pixel for every single part of the entire page, including the text. So that's why Photoshop, if you go and do a page layout in Photoshop and you print it, the text never looks as crisp as it does if you do it in something like InDesign or Illustrator and it looks very sharp and crisp. Because the Illustrator stuff will print out at whatever resolution the printer can do. So like this one here, it does 1200 dpi. That means your text and lines will come out of that printer at 1200 dpi and the images will be whatever they're stored as. Make sense? Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you can actually mix resolutions like with something like InDesign. So you could have like a low resolution background on your AO that might only be maybe 150 dpi. And then over the top of it, you've got your text, and your text will be printed at whatever the printer's <laughs> capable of. 
So that way you would have a low resolution image in the background, which is nice because you might just want to make it all soft and fluffy and pushed off into the background. And then nice crisp text over the top. And then you can have some high res images on top of that, but small ones. That's going to be very efficient file format, it's going to be nice and small, it'll print nicely and everything will be beautiful. If you did the same thing in Photoshop, the whole document has to be one resolution. So you, don't, you can't have a low resolution layer and a high resolution and a, and a vector layer on top of it. You sort of can in Photoshop, but I don't want to get into think too complicated. All right. Okay, so I've got all my pixels. Okay. And vectors, I think that you can compress it to a degree. But let's say I've got, a, 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 this is where people get quite confused. When I've got a whole bunch of images, people think, oh, well, if I want to make the file size smaller, I could just save it as a JPEG. And yes, you're correct. If you want to make the file size smaller, you save it as a JPEG. What it's doing is it's coming up with some cunning way of either getting rid of information, which is called lossy, or just um, trying to represent it in a mathematical way to make the file size smaller. Once you open that document, it doesn't matter what you saved it as, it's always going to take up the same amount of memory for the computer or the printer or whatever it is. Okay, so going, oh, well, my AO at 300 DPI, if I just save it as a JPEG, it makes the file size smaller and then I'll have no problems. Wrong. Because all it's doing is making the file size smaller, you're losing information, so your image quality degrades. You go and take it to the printer. As soon as you open that file, bang, you've got your massive big image again. Okay, you go print, and you're still sending a huge amount of deformed pixels now to the printer. So compression is just a way of making the file size smaller. Okay, it's kind of like if you had a nice, big, beautiful poster and you screwed it onto a small ball and shoved it in your pocket, you've made the thing smaller, but you haven't actually, the picture's still the same size once you pull it out, although now you've made a complete mess of it. <laughs> okay? Now, there's lots of different ways of doing this. Okay, so the math behind it, or the algorithm behind it, um, is usually suited for different purposes. So this is why you see so many different file formats. Okay, um, I just talked about lossy and lossless. Some of these compressions will lose information. They know little tricks uh, that they can do to compress a file and make it smaller that you might not necessarily notice with the naked eye. So, for example, a JPEG will actually, it actually plays on the fact that we aren't very good at telling two colours apart. And you've probably had arguments with people before on whether something is dark green or dark blue. You know? But you both agree that it's dark. It's the colour that you don't agree on. We are very good at telling things that are different brightnesses apart. Okay? So if something's just slightly brighter than something else, bam, we'll spot it straight away. If something's slightly more red or slightly more green, yeah, not very good at that. So JPEG actually works on this, and it tries to store... The luminosity, okay, so the luminosity being the brightness and darkness values, tries to store as much of that information as it can, but it loses a lot of the colour information. So that's a, that's a big problem to, if you're trying to adjust colours. So really, if you're taking photos and you've got your camera set to JPEG and you intend on manipulating the colours in that image a lot, you're going to have problems because it's losing a lot of the colour information. Whereas if you shot RAW, yes, the file size ends up a lot larger, but you've got a lot more information about all the colours that you might not necessarily be able to see, but they're stored in that file format. Does that make sense? It's not getting rid of anything. GIF, on the other hand, or PNG, goes on the idea of trying to look for patterns. So it tries to look for a big chunk of white. And if you remember, it's also index colour, so it goes a big chunk of colour number one. It goes, all oh, this area here is colour number one. This area over here is colour number two. This little bit down here is colour number three. So it works really good for, um, for logos and you know, solid coloured images. Wouldn't work good for a photo because there's no pattern. Every pixel is slightly different to the last. So if you stored, as I said before, what was it, the tip-top logo as a GIF, 
the file size would be much, much smaller than the JPEG and the quality would be much, much better. However, if you stored a photo of your mum at the barbecue, the GIF would be absolutely massive and it would look terrible because we've only got a limited palette and it would be much larger than the JPEG file. The JPEG file would look much better. Okay, so you do have to actually think about what file format you're saving things as. PDF, um, don't get confused, PDF is kind of like a wrapper. It's actually going, right, here's a JPEG image and here's a GIF image and here's some text and here's some lines and it stores it all in one little package called a PDF or portable document format. Okay. TIFF, um, TIFF has actually several compression algorithms in it. There's LZW, which is a lossless compression. So it's a way of trying to compress all the information on there, but it doesn't lose any quality. It doesn't get rid of any colour information. It's just a very clever algorithm that manages to store the file in a smaller size. Not as small as a lossy compression like JPEG, but it, it does. And in fact, it has a JPEG option as well. So you can actually save a TIFF document with using JPEG compression. So even saying that I saved it as a TIFF, why isn't the quality so hot? It's like, well, it depends on what compression it was using within the file format inside the TIFF. Um, there's also no compression. So the, the, and no compression is actually quite good if you're working on a file a lot because not so much these days, but um, it means that the computer doesn't have to compress and decompress every time it opens and closes the file and doing things with it. So it can be a lot faster for the, for the um, computer. So there's no reason not to use a lossless compression. However, just remember that if you try and email a TIFF with no compression on it, it's going to be massive. And so it's probably not a good option. If you're emailing a client an image, you can save it as a JPEG because they're not going to change the colours in it. They just want to see it on screen and go, oh, that looks lovely. So you can save it off as a JPEG and email it to them. But don't be doing something like opening and closing JPEG images because every time you open and close it, you're losing information, like a photocopier. Okay, because it opens up the image here, it is on your screen, cool, you do a whole bunch of stuff, you hit save as a JPEG, it compresses it, it loses a whole bunch of information again to try and make the file size smaller. You open it again, you start editing it, you save it again, it, 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 it does it again. So it's like running the same thing through a photocopier over and over and over. Eventually the, the quality is just going to get worse and worse and worse. Yeah, TIFF or Photoshop document. Yep. Oh, sorry, I should have had this on the screen. So, GIF used for solid colour web graphics or limited colour graphics, JPEG, PNG. Um, PNG is kind of a little bit between GIF and JPEG. Um, it's probably closer to GIF than it is JPEG, but it's got a much wider colour. So it's still an indexed colour um, format, but you can have a 24-bit um, image. So, it can so PNG's great if you need that transparency, especially in web graphics, and you want, you know, how they have like, some logo that's floating over the top of your text and you want this, like, transparency. GIF does have transparency, but it has one bit transparency. It's either transparent or it isn't. There's no in-between. Um, PNG, which is a lot more modern format, um, can have, you know, eight, you know, 256 different values of transparency in it, so you can have an image fading off into the, into the background or something like that. Um, it's still, it's meant to be, what, portable network graphic or something? It's, um... Yeah, this is more a modern version of, of GIF, really. Uh, TIFF is typically, um, typically lossless and used for print and archiving. Okay, so whenever you're working on a document, it's a very nice portable format. If you, you can spit a TIFF out of pretty much any program. So if you're in Photoshop, you can, you can export a TIFF that you can then import into some other program. You can send one out of, um, out of Archicad, save it as a TIFF that sort of carry on. A lot of um, programs will support um, PSD as well, but I tend to, if it's not Photoshop, I'll tend to save it as a TIFF document. Photoshop documents um, have a lot more information in it that is specific to Photoshop. You know, whether or not it's got an outer glow around a text layer and this sort of thing. And in fact, most Photoshop documents aren't compressed. However, 
if you go file save as, and you've probably seen this, it, it comes up with a little option on whether you not want it to be in compatibility mode or something like this. Have you ever noticed that? And you go file save in Photoshop. If you uncheck that, you will find your file size is much smaller because it actually puts a compression on it that most other programs don't support. So if it's a file that you're only going to be using in Photoshop, I would say turn that off because um, your file sizes will be much, much smaller. It took me years to figure that one out. I just always just never touched it. Um, Pict and BMP, oh, they're kind of a bit out of date now. But those are old, for, old lossless formats, one that Apple used to use. BMP is one that um, Windows used to use, which is a really dumb name for it because it's a bitmap image. But it's a bitmap technically is a map of ones and zeros, okay? either on or off. It should be a black and white image. Whereas then Windows also have what they call a bitmap image, but it's not bits, it's bytes. So it <laughs> doesn't really make much sense. Okay, PDF, um, so that stores both raster and vector. Now you'll actually find that Illustrator, um, PDF is an Adobe um, creation, Illustrator is an Adobe creation. You can open a PDF up into Illustrator and edit it in its raw format if you like. You can select the text and the images and the lines and all that sort of carry on. So, and in fact if you're an Illustrator you can go save as PDF and open it and you wouldn't even know the differences if you'd saved it as an Illustrator file. So, which um, will come in handy later on in this course. Um, EPS or encapsulated postscript, very similar to PDF but it's intended for printing um, purposes. So a lot of um, commercial printers, they'll create all these EPS files and they can send that file directly to the printer and the printer will um, will rip it and turn it into a printed document. Um, so it doesn't actually require software. So we used to have some printers that supported that and so you could just, yeah, you just copy the file to the printer and it would, the way it would go. You didn't actually open it and go file print. Um, PNE or PLN, um, Archicad used to, the educational ones used to be called PNE. Um, so now you'll actually find that you can store raster documents inside your Archicad document. So it's kind of a mixed format, but primarily it's, a, it's, it's more of a vector format. Um, that BPN file as well that you might notice, um, I don't know if anybody's saved the document in Archicad yet, but you, the first time it'll just save PLN. The next time you save, you'll get two files. You'll have a PLN and another one called BPN. Now this is a little bit confusing on the PC because it likes to hide the file extension. So you quite often just see two copies of the same document. The only difference is that one of them has a little red arrow and the other one doesn't, which um, I know is going to be confusing. Archicad is quite tricky. Normally what happens when you go and save a file, so if you open up um, a Word document, right, you make some changes, you hit save. Now when you hit save, what it actually does is it deletes the file that's there and then saves the new file. Okay, so if you're in Photoshop, same thing. You go and save a Photoshop document, it deletes your file, then saves the new one. Now that means that if you switched your computer off part way through, you have no copy of your file. Okay, because it's deleted it. And it didn't get enough time to save it, and so you've lost everything. What Archicad does is it goes... Right, you've got your PLN file, you open it. When you go save, it renames that file to .bpn and then saves a new one as .pln. And so it always does that. You open up the PLN file again later on. When you save it, it renames, it gets rid of .bpn, renames this one as, P, uh, as .bpn, saves a new one. So at no point in time do you not have a copy of your file. If you turn the computer off, well, at worst you'd have one called .bpn. So it's very clever like that. Um, yeah, in fact, there is a way of doing it. I know in Excel and Word, I think there is somewhere buried in there the option to have this same sort of file format so where it renames it. Like yes, you could, which is dangerous. because, And that's what I mean on the PC, because you don't see the file extensions, it's very easy to open the BPN, which is one save old, because it's renamed the old file. 
So if you open up your document and go, hey, what the hell, all the work I did last time has disappeared, chances are you've opened up the BPN. So just keep an eye on that. Um, AutoCAD documents, DXF slash DWG, so primarily a vector format. And there's lots and lots and lots of other formats that you'll probably come across. Um, you can always Google them and find out what they are. And in fact, I think it's one of your notebook assignments. Um, all right. I think that's it. Any questions? It's quite a lot to... Un it's, a, it's a really good idea to understand this. Okay, you're, ne you're never going to be tested on this. It's not going to be in the assignment or anything. But it's a really good idea to understand it because when it comes to doing new documents and printed stuff and AOs at 300 dpi, 16-bit uh, TIFF, you know why your computer's falling over. Okay? You'll know now why in Photoshop, if you create lots and lots and lots and lots of different layers, that your file size is going to get immense. Okay, because every time you create a new layer, you're doubling the, the, the amount of information in your document. Okay, and it's a raster document. So, um, also you'll know that this is why people use InDesign and Illustrator for doing a lot of stuff, especially when it comes to text, because you're not, you haven't got the same expense. Okay, when we go and create a new layer in um, Archicad, we're not doubling the, you know, we're not creating another whole set of pixels. We're just simply creating a little bit of text inside a document, and that's it. Okay, and things are associated to it. So, yeah. Um, and saying that, vector files, small vector files, um, are usually around the one megabyte sort of size. If you came across a vector file that was 100 megabytes, it is massive. So it's still a lot of work. It's, okay, it's not a big file for the computer to deal with um, okay, you know, when it's stored, but when it goes and open it, you can imagine there's a huge amount of information in there of these little points. And so then it's going to create all this extra information because it knows, okay, there's a point here and a point here. It's got to draw a line between it. So it's generating a massive amount of information. So you'll find that, um, yeah, vector files can get blown out of proportion as well. Um, it's quite easy to do in something like Illustrator. You can, you can um, vectorize an image. You can take in a photo and then vectorize it and it'll turn all of the shapes into, into vectors. So you get like, you know, um, sort of um, vector file images of people's faces and that sort of care. If you went to, to far higher detail than you needed, you're going to end up with millions and millions and millions of little points inside that vector file and it's going to turn into a very large file that printers will die with. So. pretty much starts at the beginning when you go and set up your document. So um, I would say anything that's um, anything that you're going to view up close, like a magazine cover, so anything that's around A4 to maybe A3 size, you can go to about 300 dpi. Okay, that's because you view it like this. Anything that's on the wall, okay, like a, anything larger than A3, um, you could go about 200 dpi. Now, it might not seem like a big difference between 200 and 300 dpi, but it is. It's a massive difference as far as file size is concerned and the amount of information that you have to store. If you go 150 or lower, you will start seeing pixels. So I'd never go below 150 dpi. It's also a good idea to um, know what printer you're using. Most printers will print in lots of 180 dpi, so they have 180 or 320 or 6 or 720 yeah, um, dpi. So if you know that your printer um, falls into that range, I would go and print at 180 dpi, because if you go 190 dpi, chances are the printer's going to drop it back to 180 dpi anyway. So, yes, not much point in going... Any, any larger than that. So 180 dpi for, um, for like your large format printing is fine. Remember, if you did it in something like InDesign or Archicad, your lines and text will be whatever the printer is capable of. And usually that's 1,000 dpi and more. So if you're doing circles and lines and arcs and text, that should be kept as vector images. So don't go and export your A1 as a TIFF 
and then open it into Photoshop and start playing around with it if you, know, if you don't have to because it's going to get rasterized. Okay, and all your beautiful, nice, curvy, straight, you know, curvy lines and straight lines and all that are all going to be pixelated, and they'll look soft. Yeah. Yeah, but see, if you were doing a layout and you had your plan, you'd want your plan to stay as vectors, and then you might have some renders. So you do the renders separately. You do that in Photoshop and then you bring it together either into ArchiCAD or into um, something like InDesign and then lay it all out. So here's my nice beautiful vector image plan and here's my nice little renders and here's my block of text. So InDesign and ArchiCAD become a layout? Yes, they become like the hub. So you're going, you bring everything out. So there's the photos you took on site and you drop that, let's say, we'll, we'll talk about InDesign. So let's say we're using InDesign. You've got all of your images you've taken, that gets plopped onto the page. They might be um, you know, at 200 to 300 dpi, that's cool. Then you might have a background image that you want underneath your entire plan. That might be 150 dpi, because remember it's got to stretch over the entire page, so we don't go too high. You, know, you might have like, faded it out and made it blurry, so then it doesn't really matter. That's a lower resolution. That slides in behind your text. You know, and then you've got your text and your lines and your graphics. By the way, I wouldn't I would discourage having complicated backgrounds. A blank background is much better. Um, I'm going to talk about page layout and that sort of carry on towards the um, end of the semester. But yeah, but the idea though is that you're not going and taking everything into Photoshop and rasterizing it and creating a massive document with lots and lots of layers and then ending up with a big soft fluffy file that doesn't look very good. Yep. Keep it simple. All right. Whew. Should we have a break? Yeah, okay, we'll have a break and then we'll get into ArchiCAD.